Stand please and let's have prayer and then we're going to go to congregational hymn. And after the congregational hymn, Cindy's going to sing and then I'll go straight to the message. Father, we again just want to thank you for your presence today. We know, Lord, you were with us in every manner today. Lord, I know that it has just pulled through the hearts of people. Lord, you know who's received it. Lord, tonight as we come back, we might not be as many, but we just as grateful for your word. We ask again thy presence. Let the Holy Spirit empty me and fill me, Lord, that I would preach according to your will and your way. Thank you, Lord, and be with those who could not be here. I ask you, Lord, just to remind them that we miss them. And, Lord, let everything we do be pleasing to you this day. In Christ's name I do pray. Amen. Amen. Hello, everyone. Hey. <laughs> if you'll take your hymnals and turn to page 13 and stand as we sing, Come the Fount of Every Blessing. Come the Fount of Every Blessing to my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy, never ceasing, calls for songs of love and praise. Teach me some melodious song, and some by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my heavenly sir, hither by thy help I come, and I hope. I beg the pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus saw me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace, Lord, like the better. By my wandering heart to thee, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take it, seal it, seal it for thy courts of love. Amen. You may be seated. in this one. The pulpit has lost power in churches of today seeking to appease the masses Leaders compromise the faith. They refuse to defend the truth by which we're saved. But there are sinners lost forever without God's atoning grace. They may scoff the cross, criticize the Christ, Lamb of God who gave his life for all. They may trample on his cleansing blood, but it's still the power of God that saves the lost. For every tongue and generation, through the blood there is salvation. So we cannot afford to compromise the message of the cross. The message 
message of salvation transcends all time and space. On that famous tree of Calvary, God's redemption was displayed. Though the world promotes a lie and boldly states their case, they will never change the gospel. It is still the only If you have your Bibles, find James chapter 5. James chapter 5. I'm going to read you a story about something that I read some time ago. And I feel like it goes with this message. The title of my message is CPR Christians. And I, I'll give you the completeness of that. I just want you to realize that uh, I have never forgotten reading about a murder that took place in New York. 59 years ago. Uh, it's fresh on my mind as it is today as I read it to you. But at 3 a.m. in the morning on March 13, 1964, a 28-year-old woman by the name of Kitty Genovese, she returned home from her job. And she parked her car. As she locked the door, she noticed a man in the shadows at the edge of the parking lot, and it was in the path to her apartment building. She felt nervous and walked toward the police telephone box on the corner to call for help. Under the street light, the man came up, grabbed her, and began stabbing her. Her screams broke through the night, and, and she's screaming, he stabbed me, please help me, please help me. 
A light came on in the window above and man shouted, let that girl alone. The assailant looked up and calmly walked down the street to his waiting car. <clears throat> the light went out and Kenny Genovese struggled to her feet and she was making her way down the side of the building when the assailant returned to stab her again. She screamed, I'm dying, I'm dying. Again, the lights went on the upper level of the apartment building and the attacker drove away. Kitty staggered to the back entrance of the, her apartment building, hid in a doorway, minutes passed. Suddenly the door flew open and she was face to face with her killer again. Kitty screamed for help until she was stabbed to death 50 minutes from the time she parked at 3 a.m. The police received their first call from one of her neighbors and they arrived at the scene two minutes later to find Kenny Genovese dead. The attack on her life lasted 35 minutes. The police combed the neighborhood and found 38 witnesses. Only one had finally called the police. When police asked the witness why they failed to respond to the woman's cries, the underlying attitude seemed to be fear of involvement. One man said he was tired, and then the housewife said she didn't want her husband to get involved. One couple said they thought it was a lover's quarrel, but many simply said, I just don't know why I didn't. But all those questions, no one really seemed to care. Does that story remind you of anything? When I read this some time ago, it broke my heart. That innocent bystanders, as they call themselves, were not going to intercede whatsoever. But what does it remind me of? It reminds me of us. It reminds me of every Christian that's allowing people that have gone away from God and we're not going out to give them help to bring them back to know the Lord. Amen. You see, it reminds me of Christians and churches who've forgotten why God has placed us in this world. And He certainly has. It reminds me of Christians and churches who ought to care, but have failed to care about those around them that have no hope because they're unsaved. We just don't care and we just don't want to get involved in another person's life <coughs> when our life is so busy that we really don't have time for it. But we're forgetting something that God has called us to do and that is to love the brethren and to love those who strayed away and to brother James, half-brother Jesus, wants to show us something of what we actually need to take care of. Verses 19 and 20 of verse 5, James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his ways shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. You see, the book of James cuts straight to the chase. He leaves no stone unturned for every Christian and the responsibility that they have. Every Christian carries a great responsibility as well as a great accountability in rescuing the passion. We used to sing that, rescue the passion. It was something that we sang at a time when people were actually going out and doing what James says we should be doing. When we know someone that's lost and we fail not to witness to them or to bring them to know the Lord, that's one thing. But what about people that was in this church that used to be on fire for the Lord and now they've drifted away? No longer caring about the things of God, but they care about the things of the world. And that's what James wants us to see. But what does this book of James have to say about CPR Christians? Well, first, 
the burden of a tragic mistake. Verse 19 again. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth. Now when you hear the word brethren in James's epistle, he's talking about one who shares a mutual life like you and I do. We share our lives together in Christ Jesus. You know, whether we see each other every day, you're in our hearts and minds. If somebody would mention your name, so that's my brother or that's my sister. And we say, how is that? Is that biologically? No, it's by spiritual, which is eternal. Folks, have you ever thought about that? We'll care more about our biological family than we will about the eternal spiritual family. I can assure you that I've had a lot of Christians come and say, if it wasn't for my Christian family, I don't know what I would have done. You know why that is? Because God is in the heart of your spiritual family. But now let me tell you, you're not immune to falling away. That's what James is wanting us to see. We can easily, all of a sudden, seem to err by speaking about a tragic mistake that has fallen on one of our brethren or our church members. The burden of this tragic mistake involves two things. The possibility that must be accepted that you are capable of drifting away. I don't care who you are. Cindy wondered what we would sing tonight, and I said, I want you to sing this, so... That's what we sing in our congregational hymn. And I don't mind in just a moment I'll tell you about this man. But the point is that it's possible for a fellow believer to fall into sin and slide back from the things of God. We call them backsliders, but you also have to see that we need to go after them. What? And beat them up? Well, if we have a habit as Christians today, the modern Christian today, instead of taking care of our wounded, we shoot them. And if somebody drifts away, how does it take you to run and point a finger and say, did you hear, do you know what that person's doing? They used to be in church, but look where they're at now. We're, we're, what? we're beating them up. We're, we're taking the wounded and abusing them instead of trying to bring them in and patch them up. James said this is what's happening in the churches. That the people that's drifting away, we don't want to have nothing to do with them. But God says we're to go after them and bring them back. And that's what we need to be doing, but we fail in doing such a thing. Now you might not have to go, and I'm not talking about in the physical sense of getting somebody the nap of the neck. So you know what you're doing. No, that's not what you're doing, friend. You're going to let somebody know, hey, you're my brother. I have missed you. I don't know what took you away. But I just want you to know that I'm here for you. And I'd like to pray with you. Now, that's how you bring the wounded to patch up. And if that person says, well, I've had all that church that I want to have, then you need to just tell them, say, look, we're going to bathe you in prayer. I don't know where you're going and why you got that thought, but we just want you to know that we love you and we miss you. Do you know why a lot of people that's drifted away, instead of coming back to the church that they drifted from, will end up going to another church because the church he came from embarrasses him to even come? Why? Because he knows the attitude of the church is not forgiving. It's a gossip church. It's the one to continuously wound the one who's erred from their ways. James said that is not what you should do. Now I told you just a moment ago that you have to see that the word, the key word in this verse is if. The use of the word means that James is not referring to an actual event in the past but to a probable event in the future. And what you're capable of. I've told you so many times if you've not examined yourself to see what you're capable of, then it's going to be hard for you to stay a Christian. In what manner do I mean? What are you capable of doing? Well, we say, I, well, I'd never rape somebody. I'd never kill somebody. I'd never, I know I wouldn't do such. 
Well, how about what James is talking about? Would you ever go after somebody that needs you, that's left the church, at one time was on fire for the Lord? Well, if you're not, you say, well, I, I, I wouldn't want to. Well, it's not a pleasant job. It's not a pleasant job at all. We all balk because we say, you know, I just, just don't want to do it, preacher. Well, tell God you just don't want to do it. He put you here for that purpose, to bring people to know Jesus Christ. And those that drifted away, to go get them and bring them back. Amen. That's what God plans for us to do. And if we're not going to do that, we're going to stand accountable for it. I mentioned a man, his name is Robert Robinson. And he was one of the young and upcoming pastors in England. And at 25 years old, he was already pastoring the largest church in London. But my friend, you just got through singing his song. Come thou fount of every blessing. But suddenly he experienced a lapse in his faith. And he walked away. He left his family. He left the church. He just absolutely walked away. And they could not hear from Robert Robinson. They didn't know what ever happened to him. But he experienced a lapse in his faith. And he turned his back on the church, on his family, on his faith, and on his God. A number of years went by and nothing was heard of him. But one day he was riding on a train from Cambridge to Bristol and there was a woman and she just looked like she was having the time of her life. She was just loving the book that she was reading. And she was looking at that book and she said, thank you, Lord, praise God, hallelujah. Well, he said, he had to ask her, said, ma'am, what's got you so excited? She said, look at these words in this song. And here's what was written. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, by my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Hear my heart, O oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Praise God. Listen to me. Do you know what happened? She looked over and he had his face buried in his hands. And she said, sir, what's wrong? And he said, I wrote those words. I wrote those words. And he said, I just wish that I had a thousand lives to have known what I know now than what I didn't know. Robert Robertson experienced what many Christians experience, and that's a lapse in their faith. You will be shocked, and I don't mind telling you there's not a person in here, including your pastor, that's not vulnerable to a lapse in their faith. Here was a hot running great pastor bringing people to know the Lord. And now he has turned his back on everything. You say, well, I don't think I'll do that. I got news for you. James says, if. That means it can happen to you or to me. Now, if you think I'm talking about one individual, you're wrong. If you're thinking I'm talking about anybody in particular, again, you're wrong. I make it very plain to you. Secondly, there's only the possibility that must be accepted, but there's the problem that must be admitted. What happened to this believer? What caused them to commit such a tragic mistake? Why are they now cold on the Lord? Well, notice the word air. James uses. He describes the problem that a brother has erred from the truth. The word err means to wander off or go astray. 
when James uses this word, he saw those who were once faithful to God and living for God, but now they've went astray. Now there's no enthusiasm about what they believe anymore. They're just making God whatever he wants to be. And some of them leave him completely and some will come and go and come and go. And they'll become, the coming will get shorter and the go will get further until they're totally out of fellowship with the Lord. That's what James is talking about here. He said the Bible is very plain about the matter of habitual sin. When you have a case of someone living in habitual sin, it only reveals that they never had salvation in the first place. What do you love more than God? That's for every individual in here to answer their own question. What is it you love more than you love God? Is it the things of the world or is it I'd like to just lay in bed and sleep instead of go to church? Or Tell me something. Do you know one of the bad things about it is when you turn around and take a look, people that don't want to come to church can't be used to win anybody to the lost or even to ones that straight away. That's right. Because they're absolutely, as James calls them, he calls them slothful. That means lazy. Well, God told us a story about a lazy man when he said he'd give him a tenant. And what did he do with the money? He buried it. And what did God do to him? He said, you slothful and wicked servant. So let me tell you what God calls the lazy Christian. A wicked servant. Because we're not doing the things God's told us that we need to be doing as a church. What did Aaron wander away from? James says they erred from the truth. What's the truth? Well, I can tell you very plainly, Jesus Christ is the truth. Amen. How do you know? Well, in John 14, he said, I am the truth. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. So he makes that very plain. What's truth? Jesus. You see, and when you err from the truth, you're erring from Christ, pushing him away. And he's the one that spent his old life to pay a sin debt for you and me. Now, when that happens... We need to go get that person. We need to go, I don't mean the old Pentecostal type. Uh, don't let that fellow out the door lock it. Uh, he's, gonna, he's not going home till he's saved. That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about you approach it in love. In love and in caring. Because this is your eternal brother and sister that's weighed from the truth. Well, we just don't really care. Again, I'm going to remind you of your biological family and your eternal spiritual family. How is it that you love your biological family more than your eternal spiritual family? You're only going to be with your biological family for just a certain length of time. But your Spiritual family is eternal. So which do you think that God wants you to take care of? Well, actually both. But one supersedes the other. Because God has a plan. And this one who's erred, who's strayed, is like when Christ told about the one that's lost and the 99 that was not. He took off to get the one. Why? He's telling us that's exactly what we're supposed to do. When someone comes to know the Lord in this church and all of a sudden they're no longer here. You know, we need some way of when people have come into this church and they're not back the next Sunday, we need to place a phone call. Now let me tell you something. Well, preacher, that's something you need to do. I really think so. How about the Sunday school teacher? How about the deacons? How about any of you in here that know that person? What stops you from doing that? And that's a question 
that you have to ask yourself because I've asked myself. James, to say, James says that it seems that if they don't try to stay close to the word, they'll wander from the Lord. And I can tell you now, we have quite a few that do that. They claim that it doesn't matter what you believe just as long as you believe something. And that's how some people are living their Christian life. True. It don't really make no difference. I'll just believe whatever I want to as long as I attend church. So it doesn't make any difference if, if I'm listening to some false preacher or teacher. I can believe what they do and believe what I do at church. Now that's the effort in a lot of preachers and a lot of effort that's in a lot of Christian people that come into the church and they don't really care what they believe as long as they can enjoy when they come. When they can't enjoy it and not enthused anymore, they leave. Plain and simple. There's times that God is dry with me. Well, I don't want to go in there and study if you're going to be dry with me, God. Let me tell you something. The drought comes and it doesn't come from God. It comes from my old nature in me. It's not coming from the devil. It's coming from my sinful nature. I'm bored with life. I need a little kick in something. I need to start doing some things that I can enjoy. And that's what I need to do. Sort of get my enthusiasm back up. And we began to try to place something else instead of God. And let me explain what I mean. My bottom line is when I'm dry, I say, thank you, Lord. What do you mean? How can you thank God when you're dry? Because of his word. His word said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Praise God. It ain't about your feelings because your feelings are the shallowest part of you. That's why you'll do things by your feelings that end up being a mess when it's all over with. God says your feelings are the shallowest part of your being. Well, if I can't come to church and, and have a feeling about it, well, that's not what I'm saying. You can come to church and the Holy Spirit just be uh, with your prayer saying, fill me with the Spirit of God. And you'll find that enthusiasm in the words being preached. But we have to see here that James is speaking about a believer who was once faithful to the house of God, once under the preaching of the word of God, once loved the fellowship of the people of God, and once acquainted with the power of God. But they have wandered away. First, they wandered away from the doctrine. Second, they wandered away from duty. Do you know anyone like that in this church? I do. I certainly do. Not just one. But probably you can put them on this many fingers that have absolutely are in the process of leaving and wandering and erring and putting something else on the throne of God than what they had at one time. They're beginning to drift away. Some are way out there. Some are on their way out there. I'll call no names. But I could look out here on these pews and where they sit. And they're not here. Hadn't been here in a while. Don't even know what's keeping them from coming back to church. The COVID thing, the excuse for that is null and void today. Well, I just don't have a way. Do you know anybody that would pick you up? Well, yeah, but I don't want to bother them. So they don't come. And let me tell you something. As Jim and I discussed one time, once you're out of the notion of coming to church, that's the hardest thing to get started back in your life. Right. And the more we're out, the less we care about the Word of God. And that's a fact. And this is what the church is saying in a manner here that James is talking about. This is what causes the death of of a church. Yes. The death of a church. What happened? Well, I'll tell you exactly what happened. 
They allowed something or someone to cause them to err from the truth. Their feeling became more important than their faith and their love for the word led to a lack of the word. Their faithfulness has turned to slothfulness. They would go out here and you'd think at a ball game, if they acted that way in the church, we'd have to change the name to Ridgeview Pentecostal Baptist Church. But I'm serious. I, I got friends that goes to the Panthers game. And let me tell you something. They're screaming and yelling and everything to the tops of their voice. And when you bring them into the church, you have to wake them up. Now, friend, what, why am I saying that? I'm saying that to tell you where you find your joy. And the Lord said, where the vultures gather, what are you going to find? You're going to find exactly what God said, your treasure. That's your treasure. God is warning us about living the life that we're living like we're doing. James seemed to say that it's a real possibility that someone among us may soon err, wandering straight from the things of God. When that happens, mark it down that that person's first strayed from the doctrine, then from their duty. First they will wander from their belief, then from their behavior. You'll see the change in that person's behavior way ahead of the time before they ever drift away from the church. Amen. They will begin to gripe about the church. They'll find fault with the church. They'll find fault with Sunday school. They'll find fault with a preacher. They'll find fault with a person that's singing. They'll find fault with a piano player. They'll find fault wherever they are because their behavior has changed and they're no longer thankful that God saved them. Now they become a critic. And their life now is on a drift. Drift. Second thing, I want you to see the blessing from a terrific ministry. It seems that I hear from a fallen preacher every week. A church is closed or a fallen preacher who's fallen into sin. Or a deacon has been caught with a woman or, or vice versa. And I'm telling you with all my heart that this is not at one time never heard of and today it's a common occurrence. Why? Because they've drifted from the truth. The truth is Jesus Christ. They've drifted away from Christ. And we're in an epidemic of that happening. Because if they heard me, they would have nothing but criticism for me. And tell me to mind my own business. Well, I want to warn you before you say that, I am about my business. Telling you the truth of God's word and the responsibility that you have as a Christian. Do you rush to the telephone and say, did you hear? Do you delight in, in, in spreading the news? Do you point the finger of condemnation when somebody drifts away? You know, James reminds us that while there is the burden of tragic mistake, that one of our fellow believers say, there's also the blessing that comes from a terrific ministry. And what is that? That is rescue the perishing. Rescue them. Bring them back into the foe. Now, you can't be responsible, but you can do your duty. They're responsible for their own actions, but you're responsible for the actions that you're sitting in and will not do anything about bringing them back. You see, God is not going to hold you accountable if they declare to you that they don't want to come back, but I'll tell you what, He's going to hold you responsible because you didn't attempt to bring them back. He'll take care of that person will go, and I can tell you now, point blank, that person will go to the woodshed. If he's been born again, he'll get a whipping that he'll never forget. You don't abandon God because God won't abandon you. And God is fierce when it comes to the wrath of a disobedient child. I can tell you that without a doubt. James reminds us this is a terrific thing for two reasons. Because... If we have a ministry that produces supernatural results, James says in verse 19, 
that to the one who has erred from the truth, we as spiritual mature Christians have a responsibility to convert him. The word convert here is the word converted. Comes from the same Greek word that means to turn around or to bring back. It's like a shepherd going after that one lost sheep. And by the way, let me warn you. I know you've heard me say it on other occasions, but I'm going to tell you again. James said this, and you'll see it in the scripture here. You go try to bring them back, and they don't come back. They tell you to go jump the creek. Well, you know what that person's doing? They're sealing their faith with God. You know why? God says, I called you. And now you tell them your brethren after they've come with love to bring you back and you deny them. I, and the Bible says it right here, I will take your life prematurely. Because that disobedient servant has strayed from God and he decides he ain't coming back. And God says, what well, use are you then? You're gone. We have a lot of people in the church that you wonder, how in the world did that person, that young person in the church? I know they didn't come all the time. Ah, oh, you've heard that, hadn't you? But all of a sudden, what happened? They just died. They just died. And they don't even know why. They wasn't even sick. What happened to them? God said, if you don't come back, now this is in James, he's saying it. He said, you know what? I'll just bring you home. Way before your time. Listen to what Spurgeon wrote. I have known a person who has erred, who was hunted down like a wolf. He was wrong to some degree, but that wrong has been aggravated and dwelt upon until the man has been worried into defiance. The manhood of the man has taken sides with his error because he has been so severely handled. His fault has been blazed abroad. That means everybody was talking about him. The church itself was spreading gossip about this person. Instead of going with loving care, he's talking about he's being hunted down like a wolf. In those days, they had bounties on wolves. He describes the attitude of most Christians and the action of most churches when it comes to a fallen believer. James says that God has not given the ministry of condemnation, but the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation. I can see that so much with the love of the Lord. We must go hunt them down and help them. Finally, a ministry that produces eternal results. Notice the impact of this ministry. We read in verse 20. Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. Oh, ho, ho. wait a minute, preacher. Hold on. How can I lose my salvation? Listen to the rest of it. And shall hide a multitude of sin. Get the picture. A believer's fallen. One of our own. Who used to be faithful for the Lord. Has become unfaithful to the Lord. So the Lord kills him. Oh preacher. I say Jesus loves me. Ain't, ain't, ain't Jesus love? He sure is. But I'm going to tell you something else he is. He's got a plan. And when one of them jumps ship. I got news for you. He's no longer good for the Lord and the Lord is first and the Lord is foremost and we were made to do something for the Lord and that's fulfill the plans of God and when you decide to jump out of, of the ship then my friend, I'll tell you what, it's full of sharks and you're going to die. Plain and simple. That's what James is saying. James is saying the death is not spiritual death, it's physical death. Things will start happening. He may send cancer. He may send something that, that's quick. I don't know. But you're treading 
in a dangerous area because you're not fearing God and you're not believing Him and believe what He will do. You know, you might turn around and say, well, I've been so blessed. I've got all these things. I don't think God's mad at me. What are you doing for God? What are you doing for the Lord? Some of you are so faithful that I just want to shout hallelujah because you are. But then we have some that at one time I would have I would have even laid my life down and said, I know that's a winner for the Lord. And they ain't here no more. Did they die? No. No. They've just fallen away from the truth. The light that was shining so bright is now just a little flicker. Just a little flicker. And do you know what? That flicker can go out quick. The warning God gives us. You have to see here that secondly, we bring them back. It's not only a life-saving work, but a heart-cleansing work. We'll hide a multitude of sin. James not saying that we're to condone their sin, but that when we bring them back to Christ, He forgives them and cleanses them from sin. And when that takes place, they're going to have a joy that's inside of them that they had once before. People have lost their joy because they drifted from the truth, and that truth is Jesus Christ. And the sad thing about it, if they hadn't have found the cancer in me, let me tell you something about the liver. It don't have no pain. don't have one nerve in it. Is that not right, Miss Becky? And do you know something? I would have died and not even know I was dying. Well, let me warn you. That is the very same thing God's talking about. You're not even going to know it until it's too late. And if God says that He's sending something to bring you home, you can get every doctor from here to California, and it ain't going to do you no good. You've waited too late. You're prematurely going to die because you've abandoned the truth. That's what James wants to be. Let me tell you something about James. James doesn't leave any stone unturned. If you'll read the book of James, you'll see that there's no, well, I don't want to hurt Job's feelings. You got to remember, he was the first one that said, I don't believe you. I know you're my half brother, but I don't believe you're the God. I don't believe nothing about you. But when the Lord visited him after the resurrection, this man became a, an absolute on fire, I mean fire bulldog pit, in every manner to bring his word out to the people and say, don't be like what I was. I am a true believer that my brother Jesus Christ is the, is the Christ, is the Messiah, is the Son of God. But I'm not. Until I believed on him, I was not any part of God. But now my brother is my king. You see, in 1902, and I'm closing, to sort of give you the up on this, we ask people to turn around, we tell people to change. But I, I wrote this story down. I thought it might be good for you. In 1902, only 23,000 automobiles were on the road compared to 17 million horses. I remember my grandmother telling me and that your great-great-grandmother was made very plain. She said, I had a date. He picked me up in a buggy. And we went right down what's called Old 321 now and went around those curves. It was getting dark. And I, he'd give me a blanket and he had his buggy going and we were just riding along. We were on our date. Now, I go back and tell you that she was born in 1879. So I want you to listen carefully. In 1902, there's only 23,000 automobiles, but 17 million horses. People viewed motorists with animosity. Say amen. amen. Farmers 
hated automobiles. So they dug potholes to get them stuck. And communities passed restrictive and unposted speed limits. And when they caught somebody speeding, they would charge them exorbitant prices that they have done. Now remember, they're doing 11 miles an hour in an 8 mile an hour zone. And they have to pay a phenomenal price. Well, that year a group of beleaguered enthusiasts met in Chicago and formed a support group called the American Automobile Association. You know them today as AAA. Preacher, you advertise them. So motorists could encourage one another. That AAA roadside assistance plan started shortly thereafter so that motorists could literally pull each other out of the mud. Oh, you tied it into the sermon. Today, millions of Americans carry a AAA card. They have that roadside assistance card. It's worth its weight in gold when you blow a tire on the freeway. Lock yourself out of your car. Or for that matter, run out of gas on a dark road. Joe don't have to worry about that. But yet the same is true of the local church. 2,000 years ago, a group of visionary believers, the apostles, went out to pull the people out of the mud. How did they do it? By bringing them the truth. Did they think up this idea? No, they were obeying what God had told them to do. So even though all of this we read about AAA, and you're going to say, his, he was pointing at me. His, it was me. He's, I'm going to tell you again. If I hit you with the rock gale, that's all I can tell you. But let me warn you. As people went out to pull others out of mud, unlock their cars or do whatever to get them back on the road, we as a church, need to go out and get these that have gone yes. and bring them back Amen. that they can get back on the road to serve the Lord. Amen. And we must not fail in doing that. I pray for our church. I pray that we'll get back on the road that leads us to pull one of our brothers back out of the mud to get back on the road that God had intended that person to do. When you do that, you may have spared his life or her life. You don't know what you've done for that person, but God does. God says, Joe, you might have saved that person from dying prematurely. So what are we going to do about it? Well, it takes every single one of us to come together as an eternal family of God. To realize that's our eternal brother or sister that's left the place they need to be back in. Let, let me sort of give you the totality of that. What is this? It's a hand, isn't it? What is this? It's a mouth. What is this? It's a heart. What is this? It's a leg. Well, we're in the body of Christ. And every single one of us make up the body of the Lord. He is the head. I'm only an under shepherd. Now what if my foot decided to go somewhere else? I'm going to be hopping. And that's the way the church would do it the church will start hopping because they're crippled. Why are they crippled? Well, their foot left. Well, all they have to do is go get it. Yeah, but they don't want to get it off. It's none of my business, my foot left. If my foot's got its own mind, let the foot do what it wants to. No. When I go to the head, the head says, go get it. So what are we going to do? Are we going to, as a church, Stray from the truth? 
Are we going to do what James is talking about? And that's go get that person. And bring them back in to the Lord. Answers in your heart. By the words you heard. And Father we thank you for your word. Let us be obedient to it. In every manner. Let us do with one thought. Serve the Lord Jesus Christ. The truth. The life. The everything. That has bought us at a high price. Lord tonight I just pray that. These that are here. And these listening by internet Lord. Would have that thought. That they need to become. One who rescues the passion. Because we have many that are. Father help us to have the enthusiasm. And not the fear of doing what you tell us to do. Thank you for the book of James. Thank you for his boldness. And thank you that we've received it. In Christ's name I do pray. Amen. Amen. You take the hymnals and turn to 187. Just as I am for an invitation.